Hey, everybody, welcome back to Autism Confidential, the podcast from the National Council on Severe Autism. I am Jill Escher. I am the president of NCSA, and I am your host today. I'm sorry we were off for two weeks, but I'm, it's a kind of sorry, not sorry, because <laughs> uh, I, I actually had a week of vacation, which was amazing. And um, I'll just share my screen very briefly uh, for those of you who are watching on, um, on YouTube. But there she is, my beloved 17-year-old daughter. We took her to Hawaii to celebrate her birthday. And do you think she was happy? She was extremely happy. So sorry, not sorry. And then um, last week was crazy, but I'm super excited to be back here in my um, really glamorous studio. <laughs> um, but uh, we are doing something super fabulous today. Uh, we're really gonna be focusing on one state. Um, it is a state that I have only been to once and very briefly, Florida. And we have an absolutely outstanding autism advocate from the state of Florida with whom we will be talking about um, Medicaid and other issues in that state, because of course those are very hot topics, not just in Florida, but everywhere else. So if you're not from Florida, don't turn off this podcast because I am sure that you will learn something that will apply to your situation in your state as well. With that, welcome Susan Goldstein. Hello, Susan. Hello, Joel. Thanks for having me. So happy to have you. I had heard about Susan actually for quite a long time. Um, she's very well known there and people said, ah, oh, Susan's so great, you have to get to know her. So finally, um, somebody down on our board who had met Susan hooked us up and um, suggested this podcast. And I thought that was perfect timing because we are trying to do um, more podcasts relating to policy efforts. So it's great to have you. Um, Susan's located in Boca Raton, Florida. Um, and she also spends time in Tallahassee because of course she's working on uh, state legislative matters. She was actually a bond trader in her youth, in her wee youth. Um, she went on to have two kids, one of whom has profound autism. She'll tell you a little bit about that. And that um, after a, a series of many, many things that she had done in Florida, um, it, it turned into a, a stint as a legislator in, in the state. And she became very familiar with um, lawmaking um, down there and now works as um, an advocate and lobbyist. She's a partner with the Legis Group. Um, Legis. And Legis. Legis, <laughs> Legis group, L-E-G-I-S, if you're looking it up. Um, and it's a group of former legislators like Susan, um, and they work on you know, a variety of, of matters uh, before the legislature, but Susan focuses on human services, education, and business. And yes, she does represent autism and developmental disability organizations, as well as others such as substance abuse and other matters. And um, we are so happy to have somebody so experienced here today to tell us about her life and work. So Good Susan, to be here. yeah, so let's start off with your story. Um, tell us about your daughter and, um, and your early days of involvement with autism. Well, I always say I was blessed by adversity. I had a really, I had a lot of ups and downs, a lot of extreme ups and downs in my life. Uh, I was one of the first female uh, proprietary bond traders on Wall Street. Um, and ran a trading desk, had people working with me that um, funded huge projects in municipalities and cities and states. So I understood how to raise money um, through public finance. And uh, when my second child was born, I noticed that she um, wasn't developing as quickly and uh, started to regress after the age of two. And I was, um, I went on maternity leave and my mother, who is, you know, was always a stay at home mom, she worked at night, but she said, you know, why aren't you? staying home you you missed all alex's milestones you know you shouldn't miss all of stephanie so i thought about it so i took an extended leave 
And then eventually that's when I saw, this isn't right. Something is just not right here. And that's when I started like, what, what is wrong? You know, why isn't she responding like Alex responded? And this was back in 1992, 1993, when only one early, 10, early days of autism. Yep. When one, one in 10,000 kids had it. And so long story short, we found one program. There was only one program at the time. And it was at Nova Southeastern University at the Bodwin School. And we signed her up. And it was very, very helpful because they had a lot of different disciplines within that university where the students could work with, I mean, and actually get practical experience with kids, not just theorize about it like most students do. And in any event, um, it just so happened that um, Claire and Dan Marino, uh, who I'm from Pittsburgh, but I didn't know them from Pittsburgh, but their son, Michael, was at that school. And we used to do fundraising events. The first fundraising event we did was a spaghetti dinner when, and Dan's mom made the meatballs. <laughs> and, you know, they were all excited because they made like $9,000. And I'm like, we can make more than that with Dan Marino. Mm -hmm. So what we ended up doing is, um, you know, we started doing bigger events. We uh, did the snowflake ball and we would make, you know, serious uh, funds for, you know, any other, if, if anybody looked at it, $150,000, $200,000, an event back then was big, mm -hmm. but it still wasn't enough. There were more and more and more and more kids. They just yeah. kept coming. Yeah. And so that's when we decided to go to the legislature and ask them for funding. So we created the therapeutic intervention program where we use different disciplines within the university and um, actually created a program at the Bodwin School. We actually, we had several programs. We had a, um, a Head Start program too, because the spectrum is so broad. There are some kids that really need a lot more help. Back then we called it low velocity or discrete trials. Now it's ABA, but we had people that um, needed a lot more help. Others needed modeling, you know, the ones that weren't as severely afflicted. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a Head Start program where they could model with typical kids. And th throughout Stephanie's life, we've just been advocating and advocating over and over um, at different levels for different services because there was no path. It was not right. paved. Right. So, so I, I went mean, to long, I'm sorry, long and the short of it is for nearly three decades, you have been doing advocacy, starting off, you know, doing meatballs with Dan Marino, you know, and now, uh, you know, and then all the way to the state legislature where you were elected, right, to serve, and now as a, as a lobbyist. So you've been, you've seen it all. You've, you've seen the dramatic increase in autism. You've seen the dramatic increase in the need for services. So now your daughter's almost 32. So tell us about her today. Well, she's in an intermediate care facility that's run through um, BARC, which is Broward ARC. And um, she loves it. I pick her up on the weekends and I get to work during the week. And I don't know if everyone is familiar with the different types of placements, but in Florida, you know, they wanted to uh, terminate all of the state institutions, which we still have two open because there are people who just said, we're not leaving, we don't wanna leave. So they're still matriculating those people out. Um, and of course, you know, everybody wants to um, get some kind of services. We have several different waivers, Medicaid waivers. Mm -hmm. There are, um, we call it CDC plus consumer directed care, where families could keep their loved one at home and hire people, or they could go into a community-based group home, which would be like them living at home, except there are professionals that manage their care and interventions, whether they need speech or OT or transportation to school and whatnot. Um, and then we have intermediate care facilities for the developmentally disabled, which has a um, which are not components. It has a component. I'm sorry, just to be clear, 
when you mentioned state institutions, the ICFs are not state institutions. These no, are privately no, run. Nothing like it. Yeah, these are privately run. Well, that's why they run. call it intermediate. That's yeah. why they call it intermediate. It's between a, a state institution mm -hmm. and a group home. It's in between that because it does have medical staff. Mm -hmm. So there are people in, in ICFs that have feeding tubes. There are people that have, you know, very, um, they're behaviorally challenged. There are people that need to have special training to be there. Thank you that for might clarifying have that. Right. I, I, no, thank you for clarifying it because I think that there are people who conflate the two. They hear the word ICF, intermediate care facility, and they equate it to um, a state run institution. Oh, no. Steffi's yeah, in a not. beautiful ICF. It's a How five many? acre campus. Oh, wow. It's beautiful. In fact, this year in the legislature, we just got them a new fence mm -hmm. to, to make the property look nice and, and a generator for one of the buildings. So when we get a hurricane, they don't have to go double up in a building, which throws them off their routine and ratchets yeah. up the behaviors. <laughs> so ICFs and HCBS waivers, those are really the two major sources of um, services for those with more severe kind, forms of autism in Florida. Yeah. But we were just talking about the waiver wait list. And I assume ICFs also have a wait list. Can you tell us about- No, ICFs of don't have a wait list. Oh, okay. Uh, what What do you mean by that? So anybody in Florida can say, "I want to go to the Broward Arc." You well, know, that's not going to happen. Florida used to have a first come first serve. So it, when you needed services, mm -hmm. okay, people caught on to that. Just like really good schools, they would sign their kids up at two years of age whenever they were diagnosed. Okay, mm -hmm. and when the funding came through, they weren't necessarily, they weren't necessarily um, triaged properly. So Florida came up with a triage program because there were people that had aging caregivers that could no longer care for their adult children right. mm -hmm. that should go before a child who has services through the Department of Education. And so the legislature passed a triage. So if you are in crisis, uh, if you are a harm to yourself or others, if you are um, with aging caregivers who can no longer care or need assistance or pass away, um, you're, you're at the top of that list. Got it. Okay. So, um, all right. I guess wait list is sort of a te technical term, but let's turn to HCBS because I assume that the vast majority of adults with autism in Florida are receiving services through waivers and not through ICFs, right? Right, yes, okay. they are. In fact, so they we, try to encourage people, you know, after you've been in an ICF for a while, they say, do you wanna go into a, but certain people can't because ICFs aren't allowed to how, uh, administer medication. I mean, HCBS. home and community, right, group homes aren't. I call them I call them group homes and ICFs. Group yeah. homes can't so, administer medication. Well, they can. No. Yeah, but the, it, it, if it's a feeding tube or something that's a little invasive. Oh, complex. Yeah, complex medical yeah. needs. Complex that, medical. that can be very, very difficult. Um, so, what's the wait list like for HCBS waivers in Florida? Twenty two thousand. Yeah, so it's huge because Florida is not like, oh, we really want to create more, <laughs> a bigger Medicaid budget. Right. Wow. Tell, me, tell me about the, the state of things in Florida when it comes to um, autism, adult, at least adult autism services and the issues that you are facing. Well, we have been getting huge increases every year. We get at least 35 or 40 million for the wait list every year. But, you know, people look at that and say, oh, you know, you've got all this money for the wait list. How come you didn't? get more than a thousand people off well because there's a huge process in florida we have something called the i budget okay and the people that determine what that budget is that support plan starts from the very beginning of the process so if they get the money to take one person off the waiting list that person has to find what's called a support coordinator they manage the care, they do an assessment and they write up the needs of that individual. And then that indiv those needs 
then are transferred into a cost plan. And that cost plan then is sent to Tallahassee and then it's reviewed by a third party service and the APD and then it's decided upon what they really need. And then you got to start looking for the direct support persons to implement that plan. So sometimes, and then once you find them, then you got to do a background check. And so, yes, so. there's, so you, sometimes you'll hear, oh, they, they had 35 million and they didn't use 15 million of it. They sent it back. It was in surplus. But the reason that happens is sometimes it takes six months to get somebody on the waiver and the funding is annualized. So they blame mm. the agency sometimes, but it's not the agency's fault. It's just all the, the, the entire process and all the you know precautions they have to go through to make sure that it gets done right. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's politics. <laughs> yeah. Everything's politics. Well, you know, good good for you for advocating for at least expanding you know the number of recipients um, in the state. Uh, do you and do the and the rates? Last year we had a big rate increase, so that's the other thing. But the ICFDDs and the group homes, the home and community based group homes in Florida, fall under two different silos. One falls under the uh, Agency for Persons with Disabilities, and the ICFs fall under the ACA, which is the Agency for Healthcare Administration. So wow. there's two different sources for that revenue. And one has serious federal compliance attached to it. Well, they both do, but both one do. of them even yeah. more. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So what are your primary objectives now um, on behalf of your, your clients? Um, are, are you know, Obviously, you continue to try to expand access to waivers, but what, what else is on your plate? Well, you know, since I've been doing this so long, we pretty much paved the way for the early learning programs, um, the Head Start programs. One of the things that we're very proud of in Broward, when I was in Broward County was after school programs for middle and high school kids, because they don't, they never existed and they still don't exist in some counties, which is what I would like to see because our children, especially, you know, those with severe autism or profound autism, I don't want to get into the mm -hmm. controversy there, mm -hmm. but people, parents have to leave work because middle and high school kids are latchkey kids. There's no programs for them after school. There's no aftercare for them. There's aftercare for K, you know, through eight, but after that, there isn't anything. So we advocate um, for middle and high school programs for, for people with developmental disabilities or early release days when parents just can't leave work in the middle of the day to come home and get their kid. So that was one of the things that we're going to work on this year. And we're going to probably try to do that through a categorical. Having sat on the Education Appropriations Committee, there's a, there's a tool that Florida uses called the FEFP, the Florida Educational Finance Program. And they actually can what they call categorize or categoricals, certain areas, like for instance, if there's a, a low income area that didn't have enough uh, computers for students, we, we had a, a, a technology categorical. And once, so that means that that had to be a priority. The money that we sent down to the, to the counties, they had to spend it first on that. So I'm going to try to work with the Department of Education and see if we could get a categorical for middle and high school people with developmental disabilities to make sure those programs are covered before they, you know, start. I mean, it used to aggravate me so much to see nothing for our kids. And we would see the all the other kids with new sneakers and uniforms going on air conditioned buses all over the place. And our kids got nothing. So I just started going to every meeting. I went to city commission, county commission. We have a taxing district, it's kind of like our hospital district, but it's called the Children's Services Council. Went there. I went to every level of government saying, you can't forget these kids. They're just as deserving and we're taxpayers. Oh, so good for you. Man, so every, call me every town lady. needs a Susan Goldstein. 
<laughs> someone to, to speak up right on behalf of again on behalf of those who can't speak for themselves and also Absolutely. on behalf of the parents who are usually so overwhelmed you know so burnt out so they, they, they don't have any extra bandwidth they need people you know who have the wherewithal to go ahead and do these things so you know good good for you good for you well and, i have to thank my husband for that too because He's a very good provider. He's a CPA. So he helps me a lot too. I mean, one of the first things I did after, after getting the money for the TIP program, I had to go up every year to present outcomes. Otherwise, we, it wasn't recurring dollars. It wasn't mm -hmm. in the base of the budget. So while I was sitting there And waiting, the TIP program was the early intervention. The right, the intervention therapeutic program. intervention right. program. Mm -hmm. So when I went up there, I had to sit and wait in all these committees. And I thought, well, I'm up here. I might as well do something else, you know? So we actually um, got money for a group home that ARC and Broward ran that was a crisis home because they didn't have anything for children. They had adult group homes back then, but they didn't have anything for children or respite for parents. There was no respite mm. back then. Mm. So we did like... Um, four overnight beds and two permanent beds to help families get back on their feet after they've experienced a crisis or their behaviors were out of control uh, or they had siblings that were getting injured or, you know, aggression, just challenging behaviors. So that was the first thing we did. We got, a, uh, we had enough money to buy a home. And then the next year I went back and got the operational dollars. And then, you know, it sounds like the I just went on from there. And then we passed the autism license plate too, after I got out. Oh, there's an autism license plate in Florida? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. Okay. And it only funds direct services. None of this research or, you know, awareness yeah. stuff. It had, it actually, we actually can measure the number of people that benefit from those programs and typically there are alternative type therapies like equestrian programs or uh there's a lot of different programs that we fund and you could you could find that on um autismlicenseplate.org we have a whole list of all the people that we interesting okay i like that idea so that um, plate everybody that buys one has to pay an additional 25 dollars but it's every year it renews every year so that yes oh man so i want to do that like in california annuity. oh you don't have one in california i don't think so i mean i i haven't seen it well the the other thing we did which you know having been a legislator you learn a lot more than any other person that's advocating out there because you have to know the rules and you have to know how to get things done and how things get done at the last minute without going through a committee. And, you know, there's a million ways. One of the things we got done was a checkoff. It's called a checkoff for autism. So when somebody renews their um, registration, uh, or not the registration, their license. Mm -hmm. So we got the registration with the license plate, but you also have to renew your driver's license. So when you renew your driver's license, you can check off to give a dollar autism services. Oh. And so we raise as much on the checkoff as we do pretty much with uh, with the plate. And oh, people are very generous during the holidays too. Yeah, and it, it, it's it's a very popular, you know, issue. You know, more and more families are affected by it. You would think that a lot of people would just give a dollar. And I don't know how many Floridians have license plates and driver's licenses, but it would add up, you know, a year lot. year. <laughs> and more and more and more people are coming here. And that's one of the reasons we have a waiting list. We have, we have a thousand people a day moving to Florida. Yeah. So you if you look at pretty, well, they're all moving out of the Bay area here to Florida. <laughs> Is that where you are? <laughs> like, in the Bay area? Yeah. I'm here in the Bay area. They're all bailing on our craziness and housing prices. Hey, Hey, speaking of housing prices, um, what, tell me about um, autism housing in Florida. Um, I, I know it's a crisis there as it is in every state, but um, tell me what, what programs you are seeing and what, what progress, if any, you are seeing. Um, well, one of, the, one of the bills that we got passed, in fact, it was Senator Stargell from Lakeland that passed it finally. And uh, 
Representative Huckel at the time, uh, before she became a senator, uh, we had something real, and it still exists. It's really stupid. We have a thousand foot rule in Florida where people with developmental disabilities can't live in group homes that were, are within a thousand feet of each other because they look at them as businesses because there are service providers that come and go from those businesses and they don't want them in residential communities. I have so, strong feelings about these laws. Uh, well, <laughs> one of the things we finally, it took us two years to pass, mm -hmm. but you know, I got up in front of the committee and said, listen, you know, golfers could live with golfers. Mm -hmm. You know, lat, uh, Latino people can live around. Seniors can live with seniors. Mm -hmm. Nudists can live with nudists. <laughs> <laughs> people with disabilities live near people with disabilities. That's not right. It's discrimination. So exactly. now we have communities of support now where they can build communities of support. So we have, I think, four of them now, big ones. One's Noah's Ark. There's a few of them. But it took us a while because we were actually getting opposed by the Developmental Disabilities Council saying, oh, of course, we can't, we can't yeah, do that because that's how institutions started. Right. But, it's too congregate. You know, yes. Right. It's how about choice? It's about choice. Yeah. Isn't it insane so, that the, the it DD is. councils are so militantly opposed to options for well, the most severely impaired? Well, you know, they like, they like the inclusion word and, and I'll, I am a hundred percent for inclusion, but don't force my kid to be included. Yeah. My kid has serious, serious sensory issues. If I put him in the same school, if I put Stephanie in the same school as my son, Alex, she would have hit under the desks. Mm -hmm. It was the most crowded school, Cypress Bay in, in the country. It was overcrowded. And I just couldn't imagine her, you know, when they were changing classes, we had to put her in a, in a special program. We call them center schools here in Florida for people with severe developmental disabilities. But, you know, all of this is stuff that had to be developed. And mm -hmm. I'm sure a lot of states have followed suit because it's been a while. But when, when we were going through it back then, there was nothing. Yeah. We yeah, but the last everything. thing you need when we have this massive residential crisis is your own DD councils going, opposing, you know, high quality, badly needed projects Safe. on purely well, ideological was the big issue. grounds. Yeah. Safety I know that like, the Ark issue. of Jacksonville had created a, some housing. Oh, it's beautiful. Florida. Yeah. I heard it's, yeah, I've never you know, visited, but I've heard it's excellent. I've been there. Well, I've seen it. I've been there a few times. One of my clients is the Jacksonville School for Autism, which was actually started by a wonderful woman named uh, Michelle Dunham. And her son is about, he's a few years younger than Stephanie. And her sister was the captain of my sister's boat, happens to be Captain Sandy Yawn from Below Deck Med, it's a, it's a Bravo series. But in any event, hmm. Captain Sandy, one day on the boat said, you help so many people help my sister. She started a school. Uh -huh. Well, the Jacksonville School for Autism, after we've been working with them for four, five years, is um, now they just bought a 44,000 square foot building. They have people coming from five different counties and Georgia. Uh, the waiting list is unbelievable. We get them about $350,000 a year for a transition program from school to work where you don't have to wait until you're 22 when you graduate or 18 if you decide to graduate. You can start getting vocational training when you get into high school. Mm -hmm. And we did the same thing for the Dan Marino Foundation. It's called the ITEM program. I don't like to use person's names. I like to create programs like the item program is the inclusive transition and employment management program. We actually, Dan Marina Foundation actually built a post-secondary school. Well, they bought a building and modified it. So Amazing. that's for, that's for higher, um, higher funk, I should say higher independent children. Mm -hmm. And they actually have certification 
the other thing is something that everybody should be doing. And we call it mission-based enterprises. Um, our Broward does it. They have actually three, no, four mission-based enterprises. One of them is culinary. The culinary school that they have, and we got them about $3 million from the legislature to build five te uh, uh, teaching kitchens. And um, they have a catering service. So the students that go through the program, of course, you know, they're, they're funded by whether it's the DOA, depending on how old they are. Once they get through that, then they work in the catering business and they get their experience, they get their resume. And then we have every year a big fundraiser with all the, uh, the uh, high level uh, chefs and they hire them, they hire these kids. And it's a, it's a competition. There's like a, an appetizer and entree and dessert. So people vote on it and everybody gets to taste it, but it's an incredible way to get people exposed to our population um, and they're just so lovely. They're such a blessing and everybody loves having them uh, around and they love learning and they're so dedicated to their jobs that um, the catering business then funds the training. So we're not a black hole as the legislature would look at us. Once mm -hmm. they build us our facility and let us set up our enterprise, we can sustain it ourselves with the business. We also have an electronics recycling one. So, and, 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 a, and a store on eBay where we do the electronics recycling and sell them on eBay. So, and, and people get a material handler certification. We also have pet care. We also have training for um, direct support professionals. So, I mean, we figured out a way where we're not a black hole. We're not gonna be at here every year asking you for recurring money. You need to put all your money into the services that mm. people need under the Home and Community-Based Waiver and under the ICF and pay these people that care for them, you know, a living wage mm -hmm. and, and reward the people who have been there longer. You know, there's people that have done it for 20 years and they don't do it for the money, but there should be a reward in it for them. Yeah. So that's okay. I hope I didn't go on too long. Yeah, no, that's so, <laughs> no, it's very creative. It's very interesting. And as I said, and as I said to you before we, we were recording, um, you know, I, I admit to being sort of Florida ignorant. I mean, what, what we hear all the time are the bad stories, right? We hear from the parents who just can't get the help that they need. And believe me, those stories are abundant because they can't get a waiver. Even if they have a waiver, sometimes they can't hire people because, you know, of the, the rates that are too low um, or they're looking for medical help and they can't find you know, the medical, you know, all, all the usual. Well, there are um, a lot of resources available in Florida. I mean, we paved the way mm -hmm. and thank God we had, you know, Dan Marino because he still helps you know, advocate on our behalf. You know, he started the hospital in Weston, the neurological hospital, and then um, mm. the post-secondary school. They do grants. They do all sorts of technology programs, virtual interviewing for jobs. I mean, there's a, there's, you just have to know where to find the resources. And you can go to the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. It's apdcares.gov. And there's a, there's a, a whole um, host of uh, resources there. Okay. And if, the, I'll, if it's I'll not there, the show notes. then call me and I'll help you find it. <laughs> um, when I was in the legislature, I became that person where other legislatures from different districts who didn't know where to find services, I became like the go-to person for disabilities. So if somebody had a constituent complaining, oh, you know, we're having a really hard time. Mm -hmm. So I would find them a provider. We have 140 providers across the state. Oh, God. Everyone must know you in Florida. Everyone, <laughs> you know, you, you have your fingers in, in every pot. It sounds like it's amazing. And, and for decades, across decades, I mean, as I said, I think every, every region, every state needs their Susan Goldstein. So what, let me ask you this, just to close up, what is your advice for 
uh, advocates and for parents who are really struggling um, to you know, get the services they need, or maybe they're even struggling on the, on the higher level. They're trying to change policies so that we can create uh, community options for our kids, or if they're just even trying to get a kid into an ICF. I mean, what advice do you have for parents who are really facing hardship? Well, I think as in any state, and I don't know how receptive some of the elected officials are, but I would go straight to the state. You know, you I mean, I had, do you mean your elected representative? Do you mean you, you start start with your state representative? They have the the smallest districts, so they're the closest to the people at the state level. And then you have senators. Sen like there's 120 state representatives in Florida, so mm -hmm. we have 120 districts. We have 40 senators. So senators districts are much bigger, but they have a lot more staff, and they have a little bit more push, you know, when it comes to, um, you know, because their vote isn't diluted, like mm -hmm. the House, but, mm -hmm. you know, they have a little bit more push, then I would suggest calling the agency, whatever, whether it's the agency for persons with disabilities, or health and human services, whatever agency that your population falls under, like we have two agencies. Mm -hmm. And luckily for us, rather than just having to go to one agency for all our needs, we can go to different agencies. We could go to the Department of Economic Opportunity for training for jobs. We could go to the Department of Education, you know, for certifications. And, and we could go to the Agency for Persons with Disabilities, the Agency for Healthcare, Department of Health. I mean, we are no longer limited. It used to be, we can't do that. That should be under APD. We can't do that. That should be under the Agency for Persons with Disabilities. No, it shouldn't. You're giving every child access to educational services, why aren't you giving them to the developmentally disabled children? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They also deserve money from the Department of Ed. And so, and it's been that way for a few years, but it, it does help when you get in to the legislature and you can stand up and say it once in front of 120 people instead of going and saying it 120 times to each individual representative. So I would say run for office, it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> How do people tell their stories, you know, to to the people that can make a difference? I mean, do people just bring their kids in? Is that helpful? Do people? I, I never um, brought my kid. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard when you bring kids because a lot of times, you know, there's good parts, and the best part is we're sitting here, we're telling you that we need help. That's your job you need to help us, you know? And, but the most severe that need the most help, like I could never bring Stephanie to tell us. She'd be walking around like this the whole time mm -hmm. because of, you know, all the input and the echoes and, you know, the marble and it, it just wouldn't work. And she would disrupt every committee meeting. So that's why I just took videos. I took pictures, mm -hmm. um, but I would always say, First, you know, I'm a constituent, or if somebody was the decision maker on that committee, I would, I would say, I, I'm a, a mother of a child with autism. Um, this is what we need. And then I would follow up with my state representative and say, you go to that chairman of that committee and you tell them we need this. Mm. So he's getting it not only from the constituent, but he's getting it from the person who represents that district. And there's a lot of different ways. I have a whole advocacy presentation that I could send you. Um, Gosh, maybe we should have you um, do a webinar for us. On oh, I would be happy to. Yeah, actually, I, you know, I think that that's such an important thing for all of our families. I think people just feel intimidated scared they don't know how to start they feel like they're just going to be drowned out they'll be ignored you know uh, we are kind of an inconvenient constituency <laughs> for uh in the eyes of many so um i would love that i i myself well some that. people some people go up and because they have they because they have to get to that point where they have to go there themselves sometimes they're angry 
Sometimes they're not very courteous. So mm. I always make sure that when, you know, whenever we bring groups, mm-hmm. you know, you can't say, you know, we hope your kid gets it because we've had people say, well, oh, how no. would you like it? If it were you, you know, you really have to make sure people understand the decorum mm. um, and are courteous and respectful at all times. Yeah. Um, because they'll just, it'll just turn them off. Right, right. Well, this is a presentation that um, we will talk about after <laughs> this uh, <laughs> podcast, because I think we have a big constituency here that would love, love, love to hear your message. And we have to go, we're at the end of our time. I feel like we just scratched the surface of things that you have done in Florida, because the menu there is incredibly long. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of complex issues. Again, we just really, you know, glanced at, but um, we will remain in touch. I'm so excited to finally get the chance to meet you in person. And honestly, to go from bond trading to the legislator, to being the super advocate, you know, to now being this lobbyist, uh, more power to you. And um, I'm just uh, so pleased that um, the Floridians among us have you in their state. So thank you so much, Susan. And I just want to say, God bless all the parents of of kids with severe and profound autism, because you are special people. I know I go through it. Um, Sometimes it's unsustainable. Sometimes you just, you get so much love in your heart. You have to do something. And that's pretty much what happened. So I hope it, I hope it motivates people that these people do not have a voice. They need a voice. Yeah, exactly. They cannot speak for themselves and we have to do it for them. Uh, end of story. They are, you call right. them self-advocates all you want, but at the end of the day, not so much. <laughs> right. So thank okay. you so much, Susan. All right. Oh, it's nice meeting you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, this will be posted soon. All right. Thank you. Okay, Bye. Thanks. Bye.